Good morning and welcome back to our weekly professional insights brought to you by the National Referral Network. This is where we talk to licensed professionals about real issues to help you see how a coordinated financial team can help you optimize your financial plans. And this morning, I've got Mike, Mike Clark, co-founder of Protection Point Advisors. I'm sure you've seen him here doing interviews, but today I'm interviewing him and we're going to talk about sequence of returns risk in retirement planning. But before we do that, hit that subscribe button, hit that notification bell, make sure you get notified when we do these interviews. We're here every Tuesday. Mike, good morning. Good morning. I am a licensed professional. You are a longtime veteran licensed <laughs> professional. <laughs> Absolutely. I have more licenses than I have since somebody once said. <laughs> hey, as long as as long as the acronyms are behind the name, you're I, good. I guess so. Okay. So Mike, we just talked about this, and which is interesting because you brought this up yesterday in our advisor leadership training, mm -hmm. sequence of return risk. We've talked about this as a firm, and I thought it would be an interesting topic uh, right now, given all the things that are going on in the market and people questioning retirement. But super simple, what is sequence of, sequence of returns risk? Well, I think the first thing to understand is the stock market returns or portfolio returns, I guess, uh, are, are, they're not linear. Yep. Um, by that, I mean, if you're looking to average, say, 5%, 6%, what have you, um, the way those returns are achieved is all over the place. It might be you get 15% one year, you get negative three the next, you get six the next, and it's, it's kind of all over the place. It's variable. And how those returns occur is what we mean by sequence of return risk when you begin drawing money out of your portfolio, say retirement accounts, say you're getting to age 73 and you have to draw out the required minimum distributions. How those returns occur really, really matter when it comes to making your money last as long as possible. Uh, so that's what we mean by sequence of returns. We're really exploring how, re how portfolio returns occur uh, and we're using history as our guide. So how does this concept of sequence of return risk specifically impact the retirees that you're talking to or talking about compared to younger investors? Well, younger investors have a lot of time in front of them, so they can ride out the peaks and valleys of the market um, because, again, they're, they're, it's not something they have to worry about. They don't have to take money out just yet. Um, but when that shifts, when somebody starts to either draw money out for because they need to or draw money out because the IRS is telling them they have to, um, it, it's very important to understand how much volatility and how much risk you're actually taking in your investments. Because if we get into a period, let's say, like, I don't know, the early 2000s, where the market was negative for three consecutive years, uh, and ba very badly so in 2002, uh, it can be very, very corrosive to your portfolio values if you're also taking money out at, during that same period. So it, it, it's man it really it's managing the peaks and valleys, I, I think is a, is a good way to say it. Um, so, so let's dig into that though, Mike, because <clears throat> I've heard that the critical time from retirement. So if you want to retire or you mentioned 73 and required minimum distributions, I've heard that there is a four or five year window before and a four or five year window afterwards that if the market takes a downturn and you start planning for those withdrawals, it happens pretty fast, right? Because if you're pulling money out and the market goes down, it could be really detrimental to your portfolio. Is that accurate? Well, it's accurate. And, and, and what's interesting, it, it was very accurate in the, once again, in the early 2000s. You remember the 80s and 90s were very uh, big decades for the market. We had this very, very long bull market, almost to where you had investors saying that they felt they could get 12% in perpetuity. Uh, mm -hmm. It was almost an article of faith that you were going to get double digit returns forever. Then came the year 2000 and everything kind of turned the other way. The market got way, way overvalued. And as it happens, or when that happens, markets tend to retrace and go the other direction. And around that time, I remember talking to more than a couple of pre-retirees, people who were about to retire, who were lamenting the fact that they didn't have enough money in their portfolios and they needed to take more risk to, you know, kind of fortify what they had. Um, 
and that's really what they were saying is not, I want to take more risk, but I need higher returns to get where I'm going. So against my advice, and it, 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 many of them did that, and uh, they live to regret it because now they're going into years where they have to start drawing out money and the market's in decline. So it's adding insult to injury. Um, what they should have done is maintain their strategy um, and, and maintain their trading discipline and all that stuff. And they, they would have ridden out that period a lot more effectively and ended up with more money in the process. So let's talk about that, Mike. What are some of the common mistakes that retirees make when dealing with these situations like sequence of return risk or market downturns? Well, I think they don't understand risk as well as perhaps they ought to. Okay. Um, they don't understand how their portfolio may behave under extreme circumstances. You have to sort of stress test what you have. You have to know how is it going to behave if something really bad happens? Okay. Not that we're saying that, you know, there's a boogeyman under the bed or anything like that, but there are these periods in the market where the market does decline rather, uh, rather substantially. Um, it, 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 we saw it in 2022, you know, we saw the bond market and the stock market decline, you know, significantly. Um, so you have to know what, what can I expect during that kind of a period? And does it do irreparable damage to what I'm trying to perpetuate, which is income for the rest of my life, which outlives me? Okay, that's the whole exercise. So I think what retirees need to understand is that, you know, how does this behave even if things get really, really bad? And am I still okay in spite of that? So... Mike, there's this cookie cutter approach to a lot of advisory, a lot of advisory firms with this idea of diversification. So if you take diversification in, in the traditional sense that's in the market, how does that help mitigate the sequence of return risk if it's just kind of a buy and hold strategy? Well, the first of all, the idea of diversification isn't just about this traditional buy and hold strategy. That that the buy and hold strategy really was the, the industry uh, coming up with a way to a address the issue of diversification. In other words, how do we accomplish it? All we know, we'll have a we'll mix it up amongst asset classes. Okay, that's not what institutions have, have done. Institutions do it, you know, quite a bit differently. Well, I mean. They start there, but they don't end there, okay? Yeah. Um, but the idea of diversification is to, it's the old idea of not putting all your eggs in one basket, okay? Um, the idea that if eggs in one basket go bad, you still got other good baskets. And, and it's still a very valid idea, but the way that we accomplish that keeps shifting because the economic elements and the market forces keep changing and shifting. And, and it, so it's a little bit like saying you can't, no doctor is going to practice medicine today the, the way they did even five years ago, especially 10 yeah. years ago. I, and so that's really, but the idea of diversification is to, is to attenuate risk. It's to get rid of or shave off some of the risk that's there through just casting a wider net. So in a way, it's like having a brake on a car, you know? Yeah, um, so it's, and it's not necessarily about eggs anymore in one basket. It's eggs in this back basket, oranges in this basket, pears in that yeah. basket. Right, right. It, it's it's the expansion of variability. It's 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 if you expand uh, the amount of, of 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 options you have in a portfolio, then what you're going to do is address the issue of risk more effectively, and that's accomplished now through a combination of asset classes, and not just stocks, bonds, and cash, but now alternatives, things like real estate, um, sometimes hedging strategies, momentum strategies, all these different all these different kinds of trading approaches. If you look at endowment funds, for example, endowment funds are about 40% alternatives now. And these are large institutional funds that are largely considered to be some of the best managed funds that you'll that you'll find. So the anatomy of the uh, of funds that are run with specific intent, like pension funds or endowment funds, insurance company funds would be another example. Um, is very, very different than what everyday investors are told to do. And I think that's the thing that we, we, we need to talk more about. So how do we adjust our behavior to align? And I don't want to take emotion out, right? Because there's emotion in everything. Right. But those big funds 
they have a plan, a strategy, and they try to remove as much emotion as possible. How does the retail investor manage their behaviors and emotions in this process? Well, I think the first thing you have to be very, very clear on is what are you trying to accomplish? Um, in the case of most retirees, they simply want to make the most of what they have, meaning they income from what they have. They want it to last as long as possible. You want your money to outlive you, okay? Yep. Um, a second thing to know is how much income is enough. And I find a lot that very few investors actually know this. How much retirement income do you actually need to live comfortably, to live maybe the way you become accustomed? Um, you need to be very, very clear on, on all of that. Then from there, it, it, it really is an examination of will what you have give you that? Um, and if it doesn't, you know, what adjustments are you willing to make? Because, you know, you don't want to wake up when you're, I don't know, 85 years old and realize, you know, I got to go get a job as a Walmart greeter because I'm not going to have enough money. Yeah. You know? um, so being very, very clear on what you're trying to accomplish is the most important thing. With all the information in the world right now, and, and it's more, I mean, Gary Vee just wrote a book. It's not a plug for his book, but it's a day trading attention. <laughs> and it's these little snippets. I mean, it, we've talked about this, Mike, that our attention span back in the early years with TV, it was, there were three or four minutes and that three or four minutes and there was a commercial. Now it's two minutes and then it's one minute. It's 30 seconds. It's 30 seconds, right? And this is a constant attention grabbing all the time. How does somebody decipher information, assimilate it, make sense of it, and then take action on it when there's so much available? Well, I don't know that I would take action on anything you don't fully understand. I think that's the first rule of thumb because there is a lot of information out there. And there's a lot of people who make a lot of money from saying this or that. Um, yeah. I think if you, if you hear it in the media, and by media, I mean social media, uh, the internet, uh, you know, TV, radio, what have you, um, you got to take the lion's share of it, if not just about all of it with a grain of salt, because it's most of the time it's boilerplate recommendations often given by people who aren't professionals in this regard, but they're really, really good at articulating a point. So people listen to them. Um, you have to take all that with a grain of salt. Um, I think uh, you have to, you have to always filter the information through the first point I was making, which is you know what are you trying to accomplish? Yep. And in the end, um, arrive at a place where you feel really good about the fact that whatever it is you're doing gives you the best odds of accomplishing what it is you're trying to accomplish. Generally speaking, you, you're, I highly recommend that everybody talk to a qualified advisor, talk to somebody who understands your goals, make them lay out uh, what an effective strategy might look like, have them talk about why they believe that strategy is best for you, all that stuff. It really is a matter of a lot of due diligence. Which is interesting, Mike, because we talk to a lot of clients <clears throat> and a lot of clients are, they say they don't have time. Right. And then, so how do you, how does a client start that process with this paradigm? And we, I can go on about time and everything else, but you get online, you look at YouTube, you look at Reddit, which by the way, are the 76% of people look at those two platforms for financial literacy. And how do you start that process to find a qualified advisor? Uh, well, it can be a little daunting because there are a lot of people out there who are very, very happy to sell you whatever it is they have because that's how they get paid. Yeah. Um, so I think one of the first things you're going to do when, when you're going to, if you interview an advisor is ask them, how do I, get, how do you get paid? Uh, the, the best advisors, and I'm, I'm being general here, but the best advisors in the industry uh, are those that receive advisory fees from what they manage. And, and the reason I say that is because they tend to be those that have been in the industry a little bit longer. Um, therefore, they tend to have more experience, know what they're doing, maybe a little bit more than, say, younger advisors. And their interests are also aligned with yours. If you do better, they do better. Okay. Yeah. Um, but it doesn't 
it doesn't end there. You also want to ask them uh, questions about uh, who do they typically work with? Um, what is their process? Um, are they delivering financial planning along with asset management? That's another one. You have to marry both applications and they are different applications. One is about the management of a component. The other is relating the management of that component, the management of that component to the larger result. Okay. Uh, it, so in other words, you have to have somebody who's willing to draw you a map so you can see whether or not you're going to get where you're going. Um, and But then after all that, um, it really is more about whether or not they're listening to you whether or not yeah. they're asking you questions about you, what's important to you, what do you want to accomplish? Why do you want to accomplish it? If they're really, really probing on who you are, that's a good sign. Okay. Well, Mike, we're, we're at our time here. Certainly appreciate the time. Any final thoughts? No, I just, I would just say to anyone, you know, do, do your homework on advisors, um, do a bit of homework, uh, on what tends to work when it comes to making money last. Um, for goodness sakes, take what you hear in all forms of media with a grain of salt. And if you're going to talk to an advisor, be judicious, ask questions, and make sure that they are doing their utmost to find out about what makes you tick. Fantastic. Well, as always, thank you, Mike. Hit the subscribe button, notification bell. We're here every Tuesday with professionals like Mike and everybody else in the National Referral Network. Yes, like Mike. Like Mike. <laughs> like. <laughs> that was a good one, Mike. Yeah, thank um, you. Thank you, and we'll see you guys uh, next week.